Oh, hey there. Welcome. Life in Red podcast. Uh, as we record this and as we are releasing this, we are on the eve of the American election. And I think this might be one of the most contested, the most important election, uh, uh, at least in my short life, my short 28 years. Um, I think a lot of people feel this too. And I think a lot of people feel there is a lot riding on, on who wins and whether that's Trump and Biden. I think we can all acknowledge this might be the most heightened and tensioned times, uh, you know, COVID, race relations, uh, foreign policy, uh, just climate change, all these different things are happening in this world. And um, you, there's even talk of a civil war happening in America. I know Walmart, uh, they did, I know they pulled back on it, but saying they're taking all the guns because they can't ensure safety off their shelves. Um, and, and I think a lot of people feel whatever happens that whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden, that the other side that doesn't win, um, could result in some, uh, escalation, um, and violence. And that worries a lot of people. So, you know, I wanted to get people who, who live in the heart of America on, and I couldn't think of anybody, uh, better to get on about this topic, uh, than my good friends from the owl podcast, uh, Jerry and Jameson. Um, and, and we had a great conversation on, you know, me being Canadian, I don't know what's happening in America. Uh, all I get is the news from Twitter and, and you know, CNN and, and all those types of organizations. So what's really happening in America? Are the tensions as high as, uh, you know, the internet makes it seem? Um, what are issues that actually kind of matter to, to Americans that live in the heartland? If you remember in 2016, the heartland all went Republican, and that's what kind of led to Trump's win. And uh, the polls never picked it up, and it caught everybody by surprise. So... I think if you look at the election, COVID, the economy, climate change, um, race relations, those are kind of all the things that get talked about. But is that what really people care about in, in you know, mid-states America, you know, Colorado, Kansas, Wyoming, those types of uh, states? So I wanted to get to the heart of it. We had a great conversation and uh, very insightful. I learned a lot. Um, so please give it up for my guests, Jerry and Jameson from The Owl Podcast. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Welcome to a life in Redland. All right, so we are on the brink of civil war, I think, according to if I'm looking at my Twitter feed. <laughs> Boys, thank you so much for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, on the two days before, maybe one of the biggest days in recent history, I would say. Uh, so uh, I, I guess, like, let's just start right off the bat. Start with you, uh, Jameson. Um, sure. How are you feeling? What's what's going on? <laughs> um, yeah, there's. Uh, so I live in Colorado, um, which is a pretty pretty liberal state, a pretty uh, Joe Biden um supporting state and uh there are you know some trump supporters and stuff like that around but um <laughs> it's there's a lot of tension right now with uh, a lot of the guys that are uh biden supporters because they are the biggest you know anti-trumpers that you can possibly imagine and uh they're you know they're they're talking to independents saying you know hey even if you vote for a third party that's technically a vote for Trump and they're doing like whatever they can to essentially try to get Trump out of office because they just have a uh, a mindset that basically he's like the Antichrist or the next Hitler or whatever and they're just like we can't do four more years of this we can't do four more years and they're quite dramatic about it uh, personally me I'm not as worried about it as maybe some of them um, I don't know just maybe more level-headed maybe i just uh have more conservative leanings so i don't typically tend to maybe be as dramatic i don't want to pigeonhole anybody saying that that's kind of their thought process but that's just my experience uh, i did have a conversation with my girlfriend who is very she's very left-leaning and she kind of gave me that same thing like a vote for an independent is a vote for trump and i'm like well i'm still probably going to vote independent uh just because you know i don't think that that's necessarily the case but they are very uh very on edge. The, uh, yeah, that's... It, um, it feels like a powder kick, yeah. Was the, a good quote I just heard recently was, um, 
when people say vote, it really means vote Democrat. <laughs> Don't vote Republican, <laughs> yeah. right? So uh, what, what about you, Jerry? What's, you're in a different you know, coast and, and everything in a, in a very different state. What, what, what's things from your perspective down in California? Uh, I've just been drunk the last eight months and I might have the first case of super cirrhosis. Um, yeah, I just buy tequila bottles by the case now. Uh, mm -hmm. No, it's, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, kind of similar to Gemma, you know, I feel like the country, I f it's, it's interesting. It's, I don't know if you guys have heard of like the horseshoe theory of politics where the far left and the far right kind of meet more in the middle, but I feel like the people in the middle and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel there's a general tiredness about the election. There just seems to be a lot of name calling on both sides and that's definitely tearing the country apart a little bit, but I feel like people in the middle are very tired, are very just fatigued by it. Every day for the last four years, something Trump does. Even if Trump misspells something on a sentence, it'll be brought up on the news, like it's front page of the New York Times. And that's just, it's gotten very tired some, it's gotten very tiresome and and obviously, with the last six months, four or five months, however long it's been, everything's been exacerbated by COVID, people losing their jobs, a sharp downturn in the election. And then on top of that, you have as high of you know tension as you can in, in terms of race with George Floyd kind of kicking that off. So it, it's just been such a unique and weird storm to be in the middle of where you have the polar ends of, of the political spectrum just at total war, not even recognizing each other, right? As like people, as Americans, they're just, they don't recognize each other as people at this point. It's just, there's such extremes. And then in between all of that has been a very unique situation with COVID and also obviously, unfortunately, what happened with George Floyd. But all of that has just made such a unique situation here and at this point i don't know it, it's just a weird it's a weird time it's a I, I definitely get a sense of fatigue from people but i also get a sense of optimism where they're looking forward past the election kind of just wanting everything to be over um but yeah that's just mm. a little bit brief synopsis as to why yeah I'm and i i it's what i find so fascinating you know about america even though i'm canadian that because America, especially with, with Canada, we have such a, a close economic and, and cultural relationship with everything. We share sports, we share movies and, and all that, that this particular election, like I, more of my friends are watching the American debates than they do watch the Canadian political debates. Like there's, it just seems like there's so much riding it and the rest of the world's eyes are, are watching. When you think of America and you think of the rest of the world, like what do you think the perception is of your own country to the rest of the world? Um, for me, at least I have kind of, so I have dual citizenship. One is in Mexico. My parents are from Mexico. Okay. Um, and so you kind of get a, a different view of the world coming from that perspective where you don't, you, you, you kind of get a, like a, a different view of the world. And I think when people, at least in Mexico, think about, about the U S that they look at it kind of like, how do I, how do I describe it? Just, there's definitely a lot of, of the perception that it's, that they're meddling in, in foreign affairs, but also just, I don't know about internally. I feel like people probably don't have a good grasp of what's happening internally. That's definitely like when I talk to my dad about American politics, they don't have a good grasp about it. Um, they definitely do as far as race relations. That's something that, other countries have played up and that was a, a global affair right uh, george floyd kicked off riots throughout europe uh even in mexico there was riots against the police yeah we had um, protests here in canada for sure yeah exactly so it's just weird i feel like when other people look at the united states maybe they don't quite understand why there's so much internal turmoil maybe they they don't understand what's going on and it's just it's hard for a lot of us to understand like it's it's uh, i look at places like france or germany and i'm like why are they why are these very nationalistic almost populist governments rising in those places because it's like france and even in mexico as well like there's a very populist leader and it's 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 hard to understand why there's so much 
kind of internal strife between those countries. But I think I, when people look at America, they just, it's a little bit of confusion and also maybe just a bit of, <laughs> they, they definitely get a lot of the maybe headline news of what Trump is and a lot of like the racism that maybe is perceived, maybe incorrectly, but I definitely view him as, as sort of this kind of boorish, very larger than life personality almost. Mm. Do you feel the same way, uh, Jameson? <clears throat> uh, similar, yeah. Um, obviously, I don't have the benefit that Jerry does of having a dual citizenship. Um, I do have a couple of friends that I work with that are, uh, you know, one's from South Africa. Uh, another one is from Russia, but they, um, you know, they've lived here for 30 plus years now. Uh, but talking to them, you know, when they were, obviously coming over to the United States, they had a lot more optimism than the United States than they did their own countries. Uh, but now, you know, they, they, they say that it's kind of gotten to the point of just being a little almost ridiculous as far as like, you know, I don't know if you watched that first debate that we had, but that was beyond ridiculous to watch. And it's just, it sends a message out, I think to the rest of the world, like, okay, this is the leader of the supposed free world. Like, this is who our best candidates were. And it, I feel like something like that first debate could make us a bit of a joke, which is, I think, really upsetting. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't have the benefit that Jerry does of having that dual citizenship and family in another country. But uh, just, you know, when we put things out there like that first debate, it definitely, I think, sends a message of the United States doesn't have their shit together right now, which is very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And that, that is, I mean, that's the perception for me, but that's what, like, you get those people on the polar opposites, right? And, and they're often the loudest. And so you get people on the far right uh, and the far left, they're kind of screaming at each other. And that's kind of all you see on Twitter. And then like, that's what the news agencies pick up. And, you know, you, you don't get a real sense of what every like kind of like the, the people who don't have social media, the people who aren't on Twitter all day because they're working two jobs or, you know, they have a family they're trying to support. They don't have time to just constantly talk about politics. And I think in a way that's kind of what happened in 2016 where <coughs> the polls were showing Clinton was going to win. And then out of nowhere, like Trump just stole the show. Yeah. Um, are you, are you, so would you both like categorize yourselves as like independent or, or like you kind of like sit on, on the fence, you might vote one way, you might vote the other, or are you more inclined to vote for one party or the other? Um, me personally, I definitely have a lot more conservative uh, leanings. I would say I'm independent just because there are things along the Republican party line that have frustrated me over the years. Like I would like to see them more, be more fiscally conservative when they preach that they're fiscally conservative, but they'd never proved to really be. Um, I would like obviously to see maybe a third party especially the libertarian party kind of get a little bit stronger voice just because i do think a third party system would probably be more beneficial especially right now but uh there are some things that i definitely lean pretty liberal on but for the most part i would say i lean pretty conservative for me i just uh yeah i'm kind of a free agent i don't really make up my mind um and then just try to justify everything a candidate says. I, I'm, I just look at what the candidates say. And for 2016, I was mostly voting for Hillary for what I thought at the time was like the most pressing concern for me, which was the civil war going on in Syria. Um, and just kind of the, the kind of the world rattling effects that that was having, right? If you guys remember at the time, a lot of the, the discussion around that time was what we were going to do with the refugees that were leaving. We had millions and millions, 24 million refugees left Syria. So that was kind of the big thing. And for me at the time, I thought Clinton had the best sort of track record. And I thought Trump was going to be very isolationist and, and stay out of Syria. So kind of the same thing here. I sort of pick a few topics that I, I, I think are important. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I mostly classify myself as independent, kind of a free agent. Um, neither party's doing it for me at this point. Mm. Um, but most of the time uh, I'm pretty, pretty much just kind of see what the candidates say and then just go from there. Interesting. Um, going to your, your third party point, cause you, in Canada, uh, I don't know how much you know about like the political system up here, but we basically have more or less five parties we could vote for here. 
And what ends up happening, it always comes down to two anyway. And then if people want to vote for um, a, a kind of, a, it's a party called the NDP and, and they're basically like the most close to socialism you can get, like even more than mm. Canada already is. <laughs> like if you try to vote for them, then people are like, oh, well, that, then it's a wasted vote for the liberals and then the conservatives would win. So it's, it's funny how even with a third party that people are still trying to police your vote. And, and they're not, they're, you're not not allowed to go through it. Um, I'm curious. So, you know, as a total outsider, and especially, like I don't have too many friends who live in in the states anyway. I I get most of my news from from Twitter and and you know the the major outlets, whatever it is, Fox or CNN. Um, and to me, the major issues that they always talk about is is COVID and um, healthcare, and I guess the economy to a, a lot of sense. And then, you know, foreign affairs kind of gets thrown in there. In in your experience, you know, with your friend groups, with the people you've talked to, are those really the things that are mattering in this election for, for I would say the, I use air quotes, normal everyday American? Like, is that kind of top of mind? Or is it, is there other issues that aren't really being talked about at, at, in the news that really matter to people that would probably persuade their vote more than what someone's going to do about COVID? I think uh, there's a couple of things that people, at least in my little circles, um, are particularly interested in. Uh, COVID is a big one. Um, like I said, I live in a state that is very left and they tend to uh, really focus on on COVID, which I'm not going to try to downplay it. It is a very serious, you know, virus and it, you know, needs to be addressed accordingly. But they're, they are painting it with a much broader brush, I feel like, um, you know, maybe, maybe making it a little more serious than I think it should be. Um, economy is big because I do know several people that have been laid off because of COVID as well. So economy has played a pretty big uh, role in a lot of different conversations. But the one that's been actually the biggest uh, with everybody seems to be race. Um, You know, there's a perception that America is a very racist country, uh, that we still essentially have a lot of uh, systemic racism, uh, you know, especially with our police force, things like that. So a lot of the conversations I have have resulted, um, or I should say revolved around race. And uh, I think that's been surprisingly the biggest issue that people have uh, brought to the table when it comes to this uh, 2020 election. Mm. Yeah, as much as I would like to disagree, I think I I think top of the issue here is probably COVID and race. Um, I would, just to throw out a little bit of my perspective, uh, I would like us to live in a post-racial world. I think mm. notions of race are, are anachronistic, right? They're antiquated. They don't make sense from a genetics point of view. Um, but yeah, uh, unfortunately, race and a lot of people's attention are kind of, especially more serious voters, people who who, who look into politics a little bit uh, further than your average voter. I think race definitely plays an issue. COVID definitely uh, one of the bigger issues. Um, and then one of the surprising things that I think people aren't talking about that a lot of people are dealing with is just a lot of the sort of effects that COVID is having um, that. I haven't seen a lot of the candidates bring up. Um, they touched on it briefly on the on the debate, and it was kind of a nasty point where they brought up drug abuse with Hunter Biden, and everybody's like, <laughs> you know, where the, the like um, Trump has accused Hunter of being a drug addict, a crackhead, and like everybody kind of was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And that's that was an interesting shift in kind of the the, the spectrum or, or kind of like a paradigm shift in our society where before you could accuse somebody of being a, a drug user and a, a drug addict and that was like a immediate moral victory for you right and now with this epidemic that we're dealing with for i guess opiate addiction um, a lot of people are dealing with that a lot of people are dealing with domestic abuse being shut in their homes with their spouses parental abuse and that's something that to me a lot of people the, the candidates you don't really hear much about that that's that's probably a, a source or a nerve that we haven't really hit in our society but that I would be shocked if honestly that wasn't something that people weren't more concerned about because even the president, like the our top presidential candidate, he his son is unfortunately a drug addict, right? The he was a crackhead. He he has a lot of problems, a lot of personal problems, and I think 
that that's an issue that probably a lot of people don't really recognize or, or isn't being talked about. Um, cause yeah, like you said, a lot of people talk about the economy healthcare is one that I don't think really shifts people too, too much, but it does, it is an important one. But if I had to say one that maybe the media isn't covering, it's that it's drug addiction, a lot of, a lot of domestic issues. That's, that's, it's a huge point. Um, and even in Canada, even in, you know, what I've seen coming out of Europe, like no, like those particular issues aren't being talked about at all when it comes with this virus that, Yes, this virus is serious. I think we all acknowledge that. And, you know, we want to make sure we're we're taking proper precautions. But the the mental health impact of not being able to see your friends, not being able to see your family, like you said, being trapped in in houses. And I know we made a joke off the top about drinking, but, you know, some people are turning to booze and, and masking there and, you know, becoming addicted to that. It's it's a huge issue. And and you know, it's something I've tried to advocate for, but like, I mean, I don't really have much of a political power to, <laughs> to keep it moving. Um, and in America too, you guys like didn't really get financial support from, from the government when they closed down or, or did you? Cause I mean, again, uh, fact check me. Cause all I get is, is the news is you basically got one $1,200 check. Uh, and like, that was it. Everything else you've been on your own if you've lost your job. Is that, is that kind of the case? Not necessarily. Um, um, my roommate for the first month and a half or so uh, of COVID during the lockdowns and stuff, he got furloughed. And uh, they actually did a uh, unemployment benefit where you were getting like an additional $600 uh, per, I can't remember if it was per week or per two weeks. Um, but basically that has continued. And then it, when it ended um, back in, like July or August, somewhere in that time frame, uh, President Trump ended up actually signing into order a a bill that was similar. Um, it wasn't the 600; it went to 400, which is still you know pretty good. So they were getting their regular unemployment um, that they would have gotten from their company anyway, but then they got an additional amount on top of that. So for my roommate, he actually ended up making more that particular month than he did when he was working. So it worked out great for him. Mm. But no, um, we did just get the one $1,200 stimulus payment. And there is talks currently of a second one. Uh, There seems to be some holdups right now uh, because it seems like the uh, Senate and the House can't seem to agree on a number. Uh, House seems to want to be right around the uh, 2.2 trillion mark, the uh, the House, I think, or the, excuse me, the uh, Senate wants to be around 1.8, and I think the House wants to be right around 2.2. Um, so the, and they just can't seem to get the verbiage right on what they want to put those different funds towards. So it seems to be a little bit of a holdup there. But uh, there is talks of a second uh, round of stimulus checks coming as well. But when that is, I couldn't tell you. Is that yeah. frust- does that frustrate you guys, though? Like that the the climate around politics democrat versus republican left versus right that now it's like basically they're playing politics with money that will help people uh from for paying rent for feeding their families but they can't get their shit together because they're you know they want to come out looking good or look not looking bad versus the other party does does that like piss people off at all does does anyone even care i mean yeah yeah go ahead jerry I was just going to say, it definitely pisses people off. I mean, you have people like Nancy Pelosi, the, for anybody that might not know her, not too familiar with American politics, but in our, she's basically the Speaker of the House, uh, House of Representatives that we have here in the United States. She's just the top Democrat, a leader for the Democrats. And, you know, she's, one, she's being very hypocritical because she essentially advocates for a lockdown, which gets people out of their jobs. And then, she goes to salons in her local local neighborhood where she doesn't wear masks. And then three weeks later, you see her saying, we're not going to essentially, we're not going to budge and we're not going to pass a stimulus bill. So it looks very bad for her. Um, It's very frustrating for people like myself that I see people struggling and they they could use actual help. And, you know, politicians haven't really suffered. Like it doesn't Mm -hmm. really affect them the same way that it affects people. Um, They don't seem to really care about the peasants. Yeah, and this is something that we can open up. It's not just in the United States. It's something that's going on globally where I think, you know, Republicans have really done a bad job of of going after Democrats in as far as advocating for something like lockdowns. Like I read a stat um, 
I think it was the World Food Bank Organization or something like that, but it, the lockdowns, the economic effect that the lockdowns are having, we're pushing somewhere like 180 million people into starvation or extreme starvation, right? Like these lockdowns are having a very serious effect and it's mostly in the United States, the left or Democrats that are advocating for these lockdowns. So I don't know why Republicans haven't played into that, but it's definitely has to be frustrating for people that, you know, one, they're, they're not able to go to their jobs and people get a lot of meaning from their jobs, right? They get a lot of self satisfaction, a sense of purpose. People pour a lot into their jobs, especially if it's your business. And one, you're telling people that they can't go to their business. They can't go to their jobs. Two, you're not going to supply them with anything to help them with those jobs or businesses. And then three, you have this other effect that isn't so widely spoken about, but it is pushing our connected economy. It's pushing the people on the fringes even further into the fringes, right? You have so many people being pushed back into poverty when we are already gotten them out. And so that's definitely something that people aren't talking about or, or recognizing too much. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating to see politicians just play this kind of game with people's lives. It just adds to that exhaustion that Jerry was talking about earlier as well, because it just seems like since they're living their best lives and we're over here just, you know, like watching, going like, okay, you talk about being there for us and representing us, but yet it genuinely seems like they're not there for that purpose. And it just, a lot of it, I feel like is turning into a show from the Democrats to essentially do whatever they can to not give either the Republicans or Trump a victory. And they want to make it so that he's out of office because the left absolutely despises um, Donald Trump and a lot of the people in the Republican party. And they don't want to, it seems like find any common ground just because they hate each other so much. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very exhausting thing to watch. That, that's the vibe I, I see from it. Like I I'm watching what's happening and what I found so fascinating about this particular election. And I don't know if it's, it's just more for like it's more centered because now we have like this this controversial figure that everyone hates and and someone who's who's trying to you know overtake that at any cost, but you, we now have I see villains on on being presented on both sides. So before like when Trump and and it was Clinton, like I didn't know who the House Speaker was, I didn't know who this was, but now I'm all like, I'm like oh fuck Mitch McConnell, like what's Nancy Pelosi <laughs> doing, like. Lindsey Graham, you bitch, get out of here. Like, it's so funny. Like, even uh, it doesn't have literally any effect on me what these people are doing. I feel so passionately about it. And uh, I have no skin in the game, but I just, it's the way it's presented and there's this fighting and this grandstanding and you hear about all these personal hardships and like the, the, the fact that they can't get their shit together and just be like, look, let's, help these people and we'll fucking we'll fight about it afterwards and to me yeah. like I'm, I'm frustrated from up here that's why i'm trying to wonder like what americans feel like it like i'd be through the wall yeah yeah you're you're spot on i mean it's <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a kind of a, it's an embarrassing show that we're putting out to the rest of the world right now i read an interesting article um about why people are behaving so sort of erratically around COVID and Maybe I can get your guys' perspective, but essentially the article argued when people are faced or confronted every day with their mortality, like they are with COVID, every time you log into the news, the New York Times has a daily ticker for new cases, new deaths, things like that. Mm -hmm. So every time people are confronted with their mortality, they tend to act a little more aggressively and a little more erratically. So that could be, it's just a hypothesis that I think it was a psychologist that put forward, but it was a very well argued paper um but that could just kind of be a little bit it, it could explain a little bit of why we're seeing so much aggressive behavior so much sort of kind of like a zero-sum contest that we're in where if one side wins, because the left has already accused trump of being a fascist and to me words mean a lot i'm very into vocabulary mm -hmm. very into language language means a lot to me and fascist means something very serious right the national socialists were fascists the the Benito Mussolini was a fascist. These things mean something to me, right? And the right has accused the left of socialism, right? Trump openly calls 
Biden a socialist. And that's a very serious accusation as well. I don't think Americans truly have a grasp of what a socialist party is, but that to me also means something. And so each side has kind of played this very extreme zero sum contest that we're in. And, and you had into that COVID where people's sense of mortality is always being faced every day. Like, I don't know, it just, it kind of would explain why people are so aggressive right now. Kind of like a fight or flight type situation, Jerry. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe not fight or flight, but yeah, it does put people on edge. It does constantly confront them with, Hey, there's something out there that's, might kill you that could very well kill you um, I, f- I think i feel a lot of people and whether it's it's justified or not that's not for me to decide but i think they feel this election very much is life or death in a way that you know for some people if if trump wins um and for those people i'm t- talking about marginalized communities you know um people of color black people transgendered you know, uh, women in a lot of cases, they're afraid, you know, Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned now, that they feel that if the conservatives win, that there's going to be detrimental con- consequences for their, their lives and their safety. Now, I don't, I'm not on the ground there. I don't, I don't know if those policies, you know, mean all that. Like, I know when a Canadian government gets elected, like, my day-to-day life, like, basically doesn't change. I, like, so I don't know. But, so that, so I don't know if it's, actually the case or if it's, that's the picture that's been painted by social media or the media that like if Trump wins you are going to die or you know if for the other side you know if if Biden wins he's going to take all your money and he's going to give it to you know all these things and you're going to be poor and we're going to be in a depression and you're, you'll lose everything and we're going to have a war like so you know what I mean like yeah. It, is, are you, is that what you're feeling? Like I joked off about the civil war about uh, off the top, but people are legitimately talking about that. Like literally before we signed on, I was reading an article from the Hill from some guy who was like, I can't like, I'm not certain like there won't be civil unrest no matter who wins the election. Yeah, no, that's definitely because the daily, the, the New York times daily podcast put a podcast out last week about, violence and about how people are preparing for life after the election and you had very sensible people both on the left and on the right and even a centrist saying i'm getting a gun and this is my first time owning a gun um and they don't feel safe there's black lives matter people that are you know that they interviewed a black lives matter guy and he's like yeah i'm getting my gun i don't feel safe in this country and that is how far we've ratcheted up the the rhetoric where people it's going to be really interesting what happens on Tuesday because both sides have said I'm to some extent that they're not recognizing what happens on November Mm -hmm. 3rd. Trump has said that there's going to be rampant fraud, voter fraud, and that he's not, he's not going to reckon. He hasn't said as much, but he's basically hinted at that. He's not going to recognize what happens. Biden has also said there's either voter suppression or, or something that, 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 you know, they're not going to recognize it as well. And that, that Trump was not, they're already talking about dismantling the electoral college, things like that, where they're basically calling it a fraud. And then the Democrats, just to pick on the Democrats a little bit here, but they've also ratcheted up that that Trump is a racist, Trump is a fascist. So you have a, a fascist racist in office. And then on the other side, you have somebody claiming voter fraud and that this is not going to be a fair and true election. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us as a country? A, a global leader, a global leader that uh, ostensibly promulgates democracy. That was the the reason why we went into all these other countries, right? To to nation build and to to essentially proselytize democracy. We can't even get our own democracy in order. And so, yeah, that I, I guess I'll just pose it up to you or you guys and just kind of see what do you guys think. Like, I feel like this is a very bad situation that we're in. like. I don't know what's going to happen after. I don't think there's going to be immediate violence but it is scary it is i've never seen this type of of dialogue before yeah um so my girlfriend is is black um and talking with her she's expressed some of the concerns that uh jerry just said in fact um she was already planning on going down to new mexico which is where her family is um this month but she decided to go the week uh, this week, this upcoming week, because of the election, and she's like, 
genuinely scared of the outcome. And she's like, if something goes wrong, I want to make sure I'm with my family. So, I mean, there are people that are genuinely concerned, especially in the minority community. And personally, I feel like a lot of that is not, is not valid fear. I, I'm not going to deny that obviously, you know, there's been some tragedies that have happened in the United States over the last several months uh, regarding black people and, and uh, you know, dying on a very untimely death. Um, but I don't feel like the fear is essentially rationalized. And I do feel like, but I do agree with what Jerry's saying too, that it seems like a lot of the times the violence, um, it seems like it, it just gets ramped up. I mean, you can look at George Floyd. All of a sudden, you know, a very tragic death happens and then there is crazy amounts of violence following the next few days. So who's to say actually what's going to happen come election day, whether, you know, Trump gets elected or Biden gets elected. It's a potential powder keg. Um, obviously, I'm not hoping that there's any type of violence. That's the last thing I want. But it just seems like it can happen at a moment's notice and that something can just all of a sudden set it off, which is very, which is very scary. Yeah, it, uh, and that's what I mean. Like, is it palpable for, for you in your everyday life? Um, like, I know just from what I've read and what I've heard that, I mean, California is a little bit more like on edge than I think maybe like a, a central state is. But like, when you go outside, do you, do you feel any tension? Is there, like, are you walking through the store kind of like side eyeing people being like, mm, I don't know, I don't trust you. You're wearing camo. Ooh. No. Or like, you know, <laughs> like, or is it just like everyday life? And you're just like, oh, like the birds are chirping, the sun is shining, da, da, da. and you walk on, you go on your computer, and you're like, holy shit, what is happening? I do often wonder if a lot of the stories and things like that we're reading are just keyboard warriors that are, you know, somewhere in their mother's or father's basement, um, trying to, to stir the pot, if you will. But the tension that you typically feel here in the United States um, when you walk around is because of COVID. And it's, you'll meet those people that are, that are like anti-maskers, basically. So you'll see people, you know, you'll be at the grocery store or, you know, the gas station or something like that. And you're walking around and all of a sudden somebody walks in without a mask and you can literally just kind of feel everybody just look over at them. Like, mm. why the hell is that guy not wearing a mask? And I have my own feelings about mask, but I mean, it's the state requires it. My work requires it. So I wear it and I, I'm not going to complain. I mean, it really doesn't bother me all that much to wear a mask. So, but you feel that tension a lot of the times I feel like from people mostly regarding COVID and it's, it's, kind of eye-opening when like when they said you know you see somebody walk in with a mask like all the eyes turn towards them like look at that guy like mm -hmm. what's going on with that um but i don't i live in vanilla valley here i mean there's mostly white people out here so i guess i don't you know live in an area that's very ethnically diverse but so i can't obviously speak for those areas but uh um as far as the tension i experience out here it's mostly just uh like I said, people, when it's in regards to COVID. Right. Yeah. It's, um, that's what I find interesting. Cause it's, you, you get all the chatter from the big cities, you know, um, New York, I mean, Philadelphia is kind of like on fire right now. Seattle, Portland are still wild LA. Like that's where all the noise comes from. And that's why I'm so mm -hmm particularly fascinated about america because you have all these other states that just don't seem to be represented in any of the conversation um and it's like do they feel the same way that the people in the journalists in new york and la do do they feel as you know antsy as people in the pacific northwest seem to be about everything that's happening i mean like I'm a fair, I'm like a liberal dude. Uh, I'm more center because there's things that the left, the left does that bothers me. And in a, in a way, uh, Jerry's talking about fascism. I'm like, well, I can kind of see some fascist tendencies on that side as well. But mm -hmm. it's, it's just interesting. That's why, you know, finding out what a large section of the population who you see it on the electoral map that you have like the blue little in all the cities and then that big like scoop of red around everything else. It's like, okay, like, so what is, I would say that's more the real feeling of America than a big city. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, 
Go ahead, Well, yeah, just uh, a couple of, uh, maybe it might've been a month ago, we were out in Colorado and not 20 minutes from where uh, me and my wife and Jameson used to live, Fort Collins was a little bar, which I would describe as, as rural Colorado, Colorado, but it was, they literally told you, don't wear your mask when you come inside. It was just a little bar. They had <laughs> Fox News up on the TV. Um, and this is, I, I totally agree with you. I, I don't think that much of the mainstream media is truly capturing what the, or at least red states are feeling. Um, you have to dig pretty deep to, to find what, to find what those people are, are actually thinking and what they're actually feeling. Um, I mean, you just have to watch Fox News. You just have to watch what Tucker Carlson is saying. Um, there's another kind of right-wing publication that I like is National Review, but I don't think that they quite have their kind of the, the thumb on the button like that. I don't think they're quite as in tune. There's a little bit more elitist, I guess you would call it, um, a little bit more traditionally conservative. But yeah, um, I think a lot of of right-wing people, of people on the right, people that are pro-Trump are very tired of COVID. That's something that I can tell you is very true, that they're very, very tired of COVID. They're tired. They want to get back to work. They are tired of hearing all this nonsense about race and, and people calling them racist. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, that's, if I had to kind of just give a synopsis of what's going on in, in a lot of these Midwest or, or middle states, that's probably what's going on. They're, they're tired of being called racist. They're tired of COVID. And they just feel like the left ratchets everything up and takes everything to the extreme. And they just, they don't feel the same way. And, and things, you know, they're just, they're kind of tired of all these things like COVID and race and all that stuff. Yeah. And I live in a little town here in Colorado called Wellington. It's about 15 minutes north of Fort Collins and about an hour north of uh, Denver. Uh, Fort Collins is a big, um, big town. It has Colorado State University there. And of course, Denver's the state capital. But, you know, you go out to Wellington where I live, it's a population of 10,000 people, very pro-Trump out here. Um, mm. You know, everywhere you go, lots of Trump flags, things like that. I'd be hard pressed to probably find a Biden one. They even had a, a stand the other day at our local grocery store that uh, was a recall polis who's the uh, the governor of Colorado um, and he's uh, polis is a very left-leaning uh, governor but you go to Fort Collins you go to Denver um, you know bigger towns they are extremely Biden pro Biden so it's it's very much the rural areas of the United States the areas that you know are outside the cities that are that are pro-Trump for sure. It's like that map you were talking about for sure is a hundred percent accurate because those rural communities are much more in the conservative um, than they are liberal. And you do get that general feeling of them being very just tired of being told that they are racist, that are COVID's a thing, things like that. So yeah, I know that carries a hundred percent. I know that's a conversation I've had with, you know, my friends who are, you know, people of color and who are very, um, you know, pro you know, pro uh, being anti-racist and, and all those things. And it, it's a conversation I've had because I always want to clarify, like I'm, I'm pro Black Lives Matter. Like I understand I'm, I'm not touting all lives matter. Like I'm, I'm, I'm here to, to help them. But when I, when I talk to them about the conversation, I'm like, you know, at once upon a time, being called racist was probably one of the worst things you could be called. Um, you know, being called a Nazi and being called racist. Like those are like Jerry was saying about language. Like that's, that was pretty heavy. Mm-hmm. And now on one, on one hand, I, I get that it's not about how we as white people feel, but at the same time, if, if we really want to, to change this conversation and have people who, who, you know, would never have classified themselves as racist, you know, being post race world, uh, all these different things that, when you're sitting around saying no matter what you do, you're, you're racist and you can never fix that. You will always be racist and you have to live the rest of your, your life basically proving as best you can that you're, you're anti-racist. You know, I'm like, listen, I get the sentiment and I get how that could make better, but you're not going to change a lot of minds by being accusatory and aggressive like that. And especially for people who, who aren't against you, they're just like, you know, the, I don't see color people. Um, 
I, I understand now why that, that is problematic, but at the same time, the people who truly believe that, like, if you're just like, you're racist, they're not going to be like, ah, damn, you're right. I am sorry. And then like, they're going to work to do better. Right. It's, it's like a catch 22, this whole conversation. And that's why I, I'm like, what's the end game? What's the end goal for everybody to admit that they're racist. And then, and then, and then what that we, we just all try to make it better. Like, I don't, I, I, I don't see it. And that's why I don't see an end to this whole conversation, unfortunately. Yeah. And unfortunately, when you start accusing people of racism or bigotry or xenophobia or whatever, a lot of the times it pushes people further into their camps and then it pushes them into uh, their little echo chambers as well. And it, it doesn't allow for conversations like what you and I are having right now. And this is very much a continuation. I think you hit the nail on the head here, but it, this is very much a continuation of what was going on in 2016. Um, if you guys remember the the whole conversation, Trump is running a very different campaign. So that's probably why people are not tuning into it as much. But Trump ran a campaign that was anti-elitism, anti the the West or the coasts of the country are telling you what to do. And they're forgetting about middle America. And that was Trump's campaign. He's not running that now, but that was 2016. That was exactly the campaign that he ran on. And he ran it at a time of very tense, you know, race relations where everything, everybody was being accused of being called, you know, everybody was being accused of being a racist. Everybody was being accused of being a xenophobe, for example, for not accepting. Remember there were signs everywhere for, in the United States for Syrian refugees. And it said everywhere, we accept refugees, we accept refugees. And people were saying, people were very tired in these middle states that, you know, they don't want to take refugees from Syria. They don't want to take refugees from Yemen. Um, so regardless of what you think of the refugee status, like he was, these people that were advocating for Trump or, or Republicans were being called racist and xenophobic and out of touch and out of date. And, Trump was elected mostly on that, on the wave of that backlash against those accusations. And I don't think, I think lucky or unlucky COVID has kind of inserted itself in the conversation here, but it is still kind of that, that, the echoes of that 2016 election where, you know, people are still being accused of racism. The whole system is being accused of racism. You have things like people accusing the U.S. of systemic racism, and it's just we're still kind of living in that. And yeah, just kind of bring it back to what you said. Like, what happens? What is the end goal here? Like, is everybody just admit that they're racist, and then what? Like, <laughs> what? What? What do you want to put in place? Like, is it? What is the goal here? Everybody admits they're racist, and then what? What? Do we yeah, do from like here? I know. I, Listen, so like I understand systemic racism and I, I understand that and they, they have policies that they, they want to institute and I can support that. I can understand. But my, my fear is, and it, and it goes for both sides, whether it's about talking about race or talking about the economy. Once you have people who are able to, I guess, um, commercialized advocacy where they're making money by, you know, writing pieces or tweeting all day or running campaigns to to kind of push this divide like to me like then then we'll always push the goalposts so it's like you could institute every single policy which would be great i'm fine with that but then they'd be like okay and now we're gonna keep going and it's like okay like where's where's the give and take from from everybody i think everyone wants a, an equal society where everyone has an, an equal opportunity chance to to live the life that they deserve to live free of harm um that they're safe that they can provide for their families but you know on the same side then you get people like you know Ben Shapiro Candace Owens uh you know Tucker Carlson who who are able to you know make their living by basically contradicting everything that these other people are saying which is only you know people are hunkering down on that so then i think that's what started to like you know social media trump sure but then this profitizing off of everyone trying to push their point point forward i mean that's also helping to get where we are and that's why i'm like i don't see how i don't see an end i don't see an end to this i think it's just like going to keep going until what a civil war and then what 
like conservatives are for sure going to win because they have all the guns. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, that is accurate. <laughs> and I think we're uh, look. It's still we're still in the nascent stages of social media. Social media is only ten years old. Like it's just really where we're barely getting into how much social media has affected us. And I don't think we're quite understanding the full ramifications of the internet and also just all being connected. We're figuring out that everybody kind of like a postmodern world where everybody has their truth and everybody has things that they're interested in. And we're figuring out that there's 10, 15, I saw a really great clip on Twitter about David Bowie and the ramifications of the internet. Oh yeah. And he's, he was, I think Joe Rogan posted it, but he was like, yeah, this is, it's going to have such a, impact on our society and he was spot on it we're we're so connected now and we're all realizing that we hate each other <laughs> now, obviously that's a little tongue too but we're all realizing that we all think differently and that we all have different opinions and especially twitter like it's easier to be in a bubble when you're in facebook and instagram because you're not going to have that many friends that think differently from you but you step into twitter and oh my god that place is a cesspool like the worst conversations happen there, but it is interesting (laughs) because you have so many differing opinions. There's no filter. And we're, we're kind of living in that the really just the nascent stages of of social media where we're figuring out, we all think very differently and maybe being connected so suddenly wasn't the best thing. And we're kind of figuring that out in reality in real time. And, and I think, you know, if our democracies and our <laughs> our societies and institutions do survive 50 years, 60 years from now, we're going to look back at this point and be like, wow, that was a very, very deep shift in, in our mentalities and in our psyche. It's, um, I read an, an article earlier this week. I was trying to find it on Google, but I couldn't find it. Um, but it was basically like, I think 80 historians around the world penned a letter that was basically like, democracy is in trouble. Um, and it doesn't kind of matter who wins that like around the world, democracy's in trouble. And now we're seeing as, as like, we're all kind of fighting, like China's just like, we're just going to keep going and doing our thing. And, you know, like (laughs) doing their thing, Russia's just doing their thing. Like all these, these other powers that pose a threat, I guess you could say in, in some cases that, they're just doing their own thing, um, whether you agree with their way of doing it or not, but they're moving on while we all kind of fight. And like you said, the, that we, we realize how much, because before we, you talk to your neighbors, you talk to people you'd go to school with. And if you didn't like the person you go to school with, they weren't in your friend group. You just hang out with your friends, but now we're exposed to everybody's ideas and thoughts. And I, I don't think a lot of people understand the complexities that can go into being a human that I can be socially liberal and, and, you know, support all that. But I also kind of want to be fiscally conservative. Like the big thing for me is like, I am progressive all the way through socially. Like I, I support all those things, but I also don't want the government to tell me what to do. And that puts me in a tough spot because all the government, like all the parties who want to institute all this social change that I agree with will also basically run my life. And I'm like, mm, I don't want that either. And it's like, so what do you do? You have to vote for the best party that you think is going to fit your values and will f- that will fit the particular issues that you care about. And then that puts me in a rock, like a hard, like a, in a hard place. And I think a lot of people are like that, that they, there's things that they hold true to them, whether they are, you know, religious, um, whether that be Christian or, or Jewish or, or whatever it is that, it's not as easy as painting people and, you know, not to use this like but black and white or one or two um, that we have all these different things that are kind of pulling at us and we have to just kind of make the best decisions that, that we can. And people just don't understand that. They're like, what? I don't, I don't get it. Why can't you just vote Democrat? Well, it's like, mm, no, I, I don't agree with taxes. I'm more of a libertarian. I, I believe free business. And people just like, I don't get it. You like Trump. Fuck you, man. Yeah. Oh, we all need to vote for Kanye. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, honestly, you could get, uh, fuck it. Like might as well. Like, let's see. Right. Yeah. Right. That's kind of where I'm at. We can make that much of a difference. I'm just like, (laughs) 
I'm like, okay, like if you guys really want to try this, like, fuck it, let's try it for four years. Does it work or does it not work? Like, who cares? Let's do it. Like, we just had a TV star from The Apprentice be president for four years. Why not a rapper? When there's Ukraine, like they voted like the a guy. Comedian. Who, yeah, like they, um, yeah, the guy who played a president on TV. They're like, yeah, sure, give it a shot. Like, like that movie I, Man of the Year or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that one. Look, I, I would honestly be remiss if I didn't talk about. It's very easy for, and I think the media has a big, is a big culprit in this. It's very easy for them to, the media is in a difficult place because they have to, they, they're in a revenue business, but they're also in the business of reporting real news. And that's tricky because you only really make revenue from stirring up controversy. If I was in the social media game and I had to look at when are all of our spikes going like when is everybody using our platform well it's mostly during these social media outrages and so if i was an algorithm if i was an ai i would think well my job is to get people outraged and to really kind of drive users to use the platform to right i feel like we're being manipulated in a sense and connected to our social media in a very harmful way where all we really see is negativity and it's counterintuitive to think, right? There's a great book by Steven Pinker. Um, mm-hmm. He's, mm-hmm. he's one of yours. <laughs> he's one of my favorite philosophers. Um, but yeah, he's a, uh, he wrote a great book called uh, one It's better angels of our nature, but then he expanded that into uh, I think it's called Liberty now or something like that. But anyway, it's a great book that shows how liberal democracies and really science liberalism and democracies and really just reason, right? It's, it's a book, the subtitles of Defense of Reason have really just made our society better. We're in a we're in a world where violence is at an all-time low, historically. Racism is at an all-time low. Religious oppression, quality of life, wealth is, we have less people in poverty and in extreme poverty now than we've ever had, right? There's less violence, there's less political oppression, less countries at war, democracies, in our modern world have never gone to war with each other. There's very few conflicts throughout the world. You can almost pinpoint them on a map where the conflicts are, right? Sudan, the West coast of Africa, Yemen, a tragedy and, you know, some areas of Southeast Asia. That's really where the conflicts are confined to, but it's very hard for people. It's almost counterintuitive to wrap your head around when all you see, it's almost like an availability heuristic where all you see is violence. All you see is, another black person shot by the police. It's hard to understand that shootings and violence, even between communities and people are on an all time low, right? In the nineties, in the U S you had 30,000 people dying from homicides every year. Now it's down to about 10,000, right? That's progress. That's, that's significant. And it's very hard for people to understand this, that we're living in a world where everything is so good for people historic right relatively speaking and the media and especially especially the media needs to pull away from always just reporting on the negative i just feel like we need some good news spurs like just sprinkled in our Mm -hmm. in our our daily news where where people aren't so pessimistic all the time and we need to start thinking about the world a little differently yeah it um have you guys seen the social dilemma i i I know it's not like the perfect movie but it gives a good understanding of i was on my phone the whole time yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's a uh no for people who like for me like so i work i work in media like my my day job is radio um and i'm connected to like news organizations um and i'm on social media and stuff for my job so i mean it, it, it's not the perfect movie, obviously, it's a documentary, but it gives a good representation of what social media does. And, and to your point, and it's, it's the same for news, it's the same for how the media presents things. It's the, it, they're trying to get you to stay on the platform. And like, if you see a, a funny cat video, like you might send it to your friend or you, you might like it or whatever. Like, and that's it. Now, if you see a bunch of videos on, you know, something horrifying or something that's very controversial, whatever it is, you are more likely to comment on that 
or, you know, like get into fights or go back and forth with somebody and, and go back and check, oh, how many likes did I get on that awesome clapback that I had? <laughs> so, of course, this algorithm that was not set out to be evil and to show us that, it just becomes human psychology that we control this algorithm by always going to the negative and always searching out the negative. And then basically the algorithm just says, okay, well, everyone wants to see negative stuff because that's what they comment on and that's what they read and that's what they do. And then that brings us, you know, all in happy news. Um, unfortunately, just like, it, like it doesn't really, as much as people like say they want positivity, most of us don't at, at least at a, at a sort of subconscious level. I think we kind of like conflict and we kind of, you know, if everything was perfect, a lot of people I don't think would have a purpose. Most people's purposes are trying to, trying to fix a wrong or to solve a problem or, you know, like that's where people find their purpose. I know even for me in mental health advocacy, I found purpose in trying to reduce stigma and raise money. If everything was perfect, I'd, you, what, would, what would I do? I don't know. Just walking around aimlessly, like laughing at cat pictures. So it's, it's interesting that I think we need challenge and conflict and, and all these things to, and then yeah, social media and media just kind of exacerbate it and, and pump it out at these unprecedented levels. Like before I would just be like, Oh, did you hear Joe stubbed his toe down the road? Oh, poor Joe. Like and now it's like, now I know everything happening. I knew Australia was on fire. I know everything about America. I don't even live there. Plus I have all the shit going on in my own country that I have to worry about. Like it's, it now, you know, and then you just kind of get lost in it all. Can I ask yeah. you a, a question though about like what's going on in, in your country? Mm -hmm. um, as far as like, you've kind of talked to us a little bit or asked us, I guess, what's going on with, uh, you know, some of the fields in the United States and stuff like that. How is, uh, how I guess is the general consensus of things going on in Canada right now with COVID? Um, and then of course, what's happening here in the United States? Mm -hmm. We we tend to mirror a lot what happens in America. That's why we're all kind of fascinated in it. You know, if if something happens there, like it, it's probably happening here just to a lesser extent because Canada, like we have like 37 million people and we're so spread out mm -hmm. um, and with only a couple major cities. But when it, when, in terms of um, COVID, you, we, we've had a lot tighter restrictions. Um, we're not dependent like we do have provinces but they're they're not as powerful as the state so like the federal government kind of is like a, a lot more i guess in charge of everything and then provinces kind of just filter some stuff out um where i am in ontario uh and we have like a conservative government who got elected on a lot of senses like he wasn't a politician um have you good do you guys know the mayor he was a famous mayor who smoked crack rob ford yeah mm, no unfortunately yeah so uh, yeah he was he was a the mayor of toronto anyways <laughs> yeah. so it's his brother who's running our country <laughs> or our province and that's a conservative um premier premieres what we have but anyways he like so we are in a second lockdown sort of it's like modified we call it stage two where you can't go sit in a restaurant um there's certain restrictions you can't go really see people movie theaters and gyms and everything are closed, but like we're not completely tucked away like, like we were in, in March and, and, and everything. And the federal government, while not perfect, have done a decent job um, taking care of people with, we have like a CERB, which was like a, basically like a, an EI program where they basically didn't even check. They're just like, yeah, go ahead and apply and take your money and then we'll figure out the rest later. Um, they haven't done a great job with businesses, um, but since the first lockdown, we opened up in the summer and now prob we're seeing spikes. So the provinces are starting to lock down in the West. We like Alberta is very much like, it's like, it's kind of like America and Canada. Like they, they're ultra conservative. They're pissed off at our Trudeau all the time. <laughs> um, because the, I guess they're kind of like, um, like Texas in a way because their economy is very based on oil and, Canada is very, you know, Trudeau's pushing like green agendas and, and all these different things. So they, they get really pissed off and they, they have a referendum group where they want to split and, and all this different stuff anyways. So the, the, they're a little bit more messy, but for the most part, like 
Canadians are, are pretty good with, with shutting down and, and, and everything. From Alberta, and in some cases in Ontario, um, it's very much like the states where the cities are very liberal, and then the rural areas, which we, is where most of Canada is, is very conservative. So we actually have our own kind of like right-wing extremist movements, anti-maskers, freedom people that are, they, they mostly are from Alberta and everything. But so like, they're kind of like, you know, messing stuff up. Um, we have a, a situation in Nova Scotia right now, which is on the East Coast, where we, you know, our indigenous people, the First Nations there, the Mi'kmaq people have treaty rights where they can farm lobster um, and uh, with, without a permit, I think, I don't, I don't know at all, but basically that pissed off all the lobster fishermen. So they're like fighting and like burning shit down. And so, you know, from, from the American point of view, even though it was like a Black Lives Matter and everything was burning, like we see that kind of escalation start to come up to Canada where, the, where they kind of see that they're like, oh, well, like, you know, that's like the first time people have ever been burning stuff down in a fight. But like now that it happened in America, people are kind of like, oh, okay, like I'll do that too then. And you, the so there's monkey do type thing. Yeah, there's 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 very much like a, a, a tension like that. And because we're so liberal, um, you know, we're admitting to like us having a systemic government. But then the right politicians who um, who don't believe that are, are fighting that. And we have. Um, what's called a minority government right now. So that basically means because we have so many parties that um, the vote kind of got split where one government won like the most votes, but it wasn't enough votes to be a majority, which means they would control all the power. So they basically have to play with the other parties in order to get shit done. So Hmm. they have to be like, okay, well the conservatives and the liberals are basically Democrats and Republicans, so they they never agree. They fight on everything. They hate each other. Blah 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 blah. But then we have that little party. We have the NDP, the Green Party, which is like two people, two seats. But I mean, <laughs> they they do win some seats. And then in Quebec, I don't know if you're familiar with Quebec, but we they're they're like also very right wing in a way. And the Bloc Québécois, which is basically like a a French sovereignty party, where they just all they care about is speaking French and French rights and preserving French, they win a large part in Quebec. So like they get voted in. So (laughs) Trudeau has to basically be like, okay, I want to do this. And then the conservatives are like, fuck you. No, you're not doing it. And the NDP are like, you can do it, but you got to do this stuff for us. And Mm -hmm. so there's always like these, these games right now. And and every time something happens, like we're at threat of an election because they can have a confidence vote where you lose confidence in the, the government and then, the other MPs basically were like, no, we don't believe in this. We need to have another election. So it's just this very, I don't know. Right now, America is definitely distracting it. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know what's going to happen once that that's done because there's, it's very unsettled too with us in, in a lot of ways. Sounds exhausting. <laughs> that's, that's basically like Canada's politi- political kind of thing. But with COVID, like, out east there's like no cases basically because they've like shut down their provinces from anyone coming in and out and basically every other province is seeing a a big spike but only in like the major cities which is very you know like you can understand that so like um, my parents live 25 minutes from from ottawa and they don't have any really lockdowns you can still go sit in a restaurant but in Ottawa, you can't. So it's it's very weird. And but like we, that's our how we're kind of doing it. We're trying to like target the hot spots, even though you can leave anytime. So it's very like I don't know. It seems silly in some ways, but it's similar to what's actually happened <clears throat> here in Colorado with uh, in California. Like Jerry and I have talked um, a bit, and Newsom, who's a very progressive uh, governor, he's he has sounds like and jerry i'll let you kind of take the wheel a little bit more on this but it's got a very much more lockdown feel you know whatever you're trying to do or whatever you do you have to try to prevent the spread type feel um as opposed to here in colorado like in the county that i live in 
Uh, there's, you know, a mandate for mask and social distancing and all these things, but restaurants are still open, gyms are still open, uh, but you go even one county over, um, it's in that county that Jerry was talking about where we went to the little restaurant where they didn't even have masks or anything like that on, because in that county, they're like, no, you don't have to wear those, we don't care. Um, but, I mean, from state to state, there's definitely big differences, especially California, New York, um, Florida's seems like there's no restrictions whatsoever down in Florida and same with parts of Arizona it sounds like but um, but yeah I mean I'll let Jerry talk a little bit more on that since he lives actually in California yeah if uh, if our if our governor was trying to figure out how to piss everybody off both left and right he he found the perfect formula because he has done just <laughs> that I've never seen a man so hated by both both sides of the political spectrum um, but yeah, just like everybody, I think they're frustrated by the what's seemed like a real lack of leadership by both our federal government um, and our states. Our states are a lot more independent than what it sounds like from Canada. Um, mm -hmm. There's obviously a very strong federalism here where states are very independent and they kind of, whenever they do need assistance, they ask the federal government. So that's pretty much the only time the states would reach out to the federal government and it doesn't work the other way. Um, so go, our, our governor Newsom has just really confused the situation. Um, he has pretty unclear guidelines as to what's happening. You can, some people can go out to restaurants. Some people can't like it's just some counties can't just depends on your, your death rate and your infection rate. So it's just been a very frustrating, unclear lack of true leadership and a kind of like a lack of, of what we're actually trying to accomplish. Yeah, like I'm I'm pro lockdown in a way. Like so I understand trying to stop the spread. I'm like I, I, I grasp that part. What bothers me is that they're like, we're gonna lock down. And I think it's very similar in the States, but and it's the big thing in Canada right now. And they're just like, and you'll figure it out. Like you you wanna exercise for mental health? Well, you're gonna have to figure it out. You lose your job. Uh, like at, at the beginning they took care of us, but right now it's just very loosey goosey for businesses. They're like, okay, you got to close down and uh, good luck. Um, oh, it's like, so when you, you know, I have uh, friends who, who, you know, are very pragmatic, which I really appreciate. And, and they work like their ICU doctors, their uh, epidemiologists, like, so they, they understand the virus and the, the severity of it, but they're also being very, pragmatic when it comes to what we're talking about with locking down and then i i have friends who are very left wing very you know on that side who are just like lock it down lock everything down and i i think this is like it just goes into the whole broader conversation of left versus right and this whole political discussion we're having is i've i i find a lot of the things that the le like the far left preach like they're very short-sighted as if they're not thinking about, you know, potential consequences or, you know, they're just like, we'll lock it down and the government will solve everything. And you're just kind of like, man, like, I don't know if you know anything about the government, but like, they can't solve shit. Like we have a problem in the federal government where it's been like seven years and they still haven't fixed their payroll software and mm -hmm. people are still getting underpaid and overpaid and having to pay shit back and not getting paid for months. Right. Like, it's been seven years and they haven't figured that out. Like, mm, and you're, you're really going to let them play games with how this is all going to play out. Like, you know, and that goes into that, the whole mental health thing, people losing their businesses, uh, like everything that, that plays out in, they're just like, no, lock it down, control the virus. And like, don't think about anything else. And you're saying, yeah, there's a, a great, um, it's a little bit different, but it's a good analogy. It's a, there's a problem in artificial intelligence and they're asking the artificial intelligence, they're creating this artificial intelligence and they're saying, all right, AI, uh, we need you to f get rid of spam mail. Right. And if you don't implement common sense into the AI, well, what's the best way to get rid of spam mail? Well, who creates spam? Well, humans create spam. So get rid of humans. And you get rid of all spam mail. Right. <laughs> like, mm. And it's this kind of like, approach to lockdowns where it's like well what's and just a little background here for me like my degree is actually in microbiology so oh, yes sure. I, I i understand viruses and if obviously if i had to get rid of a virus well yes the way that the virus transmits 
is through the air. You breathe on people and it's, it's a coronavirus. It's going to spread right through the air and water droplets. So yes, obviously if I had, if I wanted to stop the virus, yes, I would get everybody to stop moving and stop talking to each other. And yes, you're going to get rid of the virus, but that's like you said, Ryan, very short sighted. Like you're, you're not taking into account. I am not a, I'm not an economist. I am not a million other jobs that I am not qualified to speak on, right? Like food and our economy and our supply chains. There's so many people that I speak to and so many businesses that they're like, yeah, this is still shut down. The border, the U S Canada border is still shut down and people can't do business. There's so many businesses that rely on that border being open oil. Oil has been disproportionately hit by this lockdown. People don't think about this food. People need food. And it's not just, you can't just lock it down and expect things to get better. Like, I feel like that's kind of almost a, for lack of a better term, a very privileged thing to say. If you are Mm. a very fringe member in our society, in our world society, especially in our global society, like you are the one that is most affected by this. If you're, if you're down on your luck, if you're almost living paycheck to paycheck or you're in a very extreme situation, these lockdowns have affected you the most. Like I'll be fine. Middle class guy, like, yeah, okay, I can make it. And the government's going to subsidize a little bit of my income. Great. That's not really going to affect me. But if I'm really on the fringes, if I'm barely scraping by, I can't afford to not make another paycheck. I can't afford to wait for the economy to open up. Right. And that's, it's a very privileged thing to say. And that's been my frustration is to just say, yeah, you could just lock it down and we'll get rid of it. And the only thing that matters is getting rid of the virus. Well, no, it's not that simple, unfortunately. Do you have anything to add to that one? Jameson? Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, I think he hit the nail on the head. Um, it's just, it's kind of strange, you know, back in March, uh, April, you know, they were talking like that's when the first lockdown happened. They'd be like, okay, we're talking like a month and things will be better, you know, in a month, month passes by, mm. things aren't better. And then, you know, two months go by, things still aren't better. And, uh, <clears throat> I was, I was thinking, um, this might be kind of all over the place, so I apologize, but, I was thinking kind of um, about some of your questions earlier and then thinking about the lockdown that happened back in like March and April and how there was a feeling across the United States of basically like, we're in this together. We're in this together. We're going to get through this together. We're going to do this all together. And people were like gung ho about it. They're like, yeah, we're in this together. Yeah. We're totally all in this together. And then now here we are six months later, we're at each other's throats. No, nobody seems to be in this together anymore. And it just seems like now everybody's even at more odds with each other than they were, you know, even a month ago. So it just, it's kind of crazy how things have changed so much in these six months. And, you know, you just start adding COVID into it. It just exacerbates everything. So, yeah, it yeah. almost, it had that feeling where it's like, oh, this is the thing that's going to like unite humans. Like we're, mm-hmm this virus like we all have a part to play like this is where we'll come together and i think like the first like couple of weeks like uh, people were a little nicer on social media people you know like being a little more like trepidatious and like political discussions like there wasn't a lot of that and then all of a sudden it just like fucking ignited again like a like a flame like just yeah. and george floyd and then you know everything else that's sort of like brianna taylor um all those things started happening and then you know and then election I've like really kicked off and like now we're just we're at this point where like i i, I don't have any like i don't know what's going to happen yeah um it, and, any unity that was there seems to be gone now yeah and it's true uh, um my boss at work has this she she says this uh, a lot because because that and you'd expect that's what leaders to say like if a leader didn't say that you'd be like uh shit like right you're trying to unify your your country or your people or your company whatever mm-hmm. but we're in this together in the sense that we're all dealing with the virus, but we're all in so many different circumstances. I think about healthcare workers who basically, you know, are like putting their friend or their family in jeopardy. They, if they have kids or anything that like they're going to work every day and, and like they could potentially be carrying the virus or get sick themselves. You think about all the people, you know, 
I, I love that point of like a privileged point because you have like people, these low income people working these menial jobs that have to stay open, whether it's the grocery store or McDonald's or, or the yeah, corner store, whatever. Essential. Yeah. yeah. And like the, people would laugh at them like, Oh, you're pumping my gas. Aha, you're a piece of shit. And now they're mm-hmm. the ones who are keeping the country running, but also putting their health on the line. And it makes me think of like the, the States where, there's there's no restrictions at all, like in Arizona or whatever, and it's free run. You know, you have someone coming in who's potentially sick with the virus and there's there's nothing being done and you're potentially putting these people who have to be there for I don't know what your minimum wage is in America. I think it's like seven bucks or something, but like I think here in Colorado get... it's about eleven twenty five an hour. Shout out to Colorado, man. First to legalize <laughs> weed. I think you guys are getting mushrooms going. Like <laughs> yeah, I would totally yeah. move to Colorado. <laughs> Well, that's the problem. Everybody's like, I'll totally move to Colorado now. And our, our, you know, great. It's been great for our economy, but it's also been terrible for our housing market. If you want to buy something, it's just, it's like that little shoebox of an apartment is how much? Oh, okay. It's like <laughs> a yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to get off your No, that's okay. Um, and I guess like, I mean, I think we all listen to Rogan, it sounds like. So like him talking about Texas and everyone's like, that's great. You're coming to Texas, but don't fuck around in Texas. Mm-hmm. We want our guns and our tigers. I want to leave uh, this on, uh, on one final note here. And it's a question I'm going to pose to, to both of you. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to ask who you voted for, but like, what's your prediction on the outcome, both of, both of the election and of this this turmoil that we've been we've been talking about the kind of the entire podcast. I'll start with you, uh, Jameson. What what do you think is going to happen on on Tuesday night? You know, I have to admit I was super surprised uh, back in 2016. I I was really believing the polls because uh, everybody was saying mm-hmm. back in 2016 that Hillary was going to just win this in a landslide. And so come Tuesday night, you know, I was like, hot hot damn, like this is a, this is insane. Um, so I, I honestly don't know because the polls right now are once again predicting Biden, but this time it does have a different feel. Like I know, like I talked to some people that were pretty pro Trump in 2016, um, who are now, you know, they're going to vote, actually they're voting independent. Like they're going to vote third party because we couldn't have picked another two worst candidates again, but uh, so I feel like at this point, it really could be either Biden or Trump. Uh, a small part of me believes that it's going to be Trump again. Um, and that's kind of where I'm leaning more. Uh, but I wouldn't be shocked if Biden won. But um, if I were to call it right now, I, I some just gut instinct is saying I think Trump's going to win again. Mm-hmm. So, Was there another part to your question there? Or what do I think is going to happen as far as like uh, what people are going to do? Mm. Um, do you think it will be yeah. civil war? <laughs> I think civil war would be, if, if I had a prediction, like civil war is not going to happen overnight. If, if anything was going to happen, it would probably happen in some major cities. Um, and I, And if you want my honest opinion, it's, the election probably wouldn't lead the country to a civil war. I think the biggest, the biggest worry that I have in my mind right now, which is going to lead to violence is what happens to those officers in the George Floyd um, uh, incident there. Cause I could see like, there's a video that was recently released that Jerry shared with me that paints the, that paints the whole situation in a much different light. And it, it talks about a lot of different things because a lot of people only saw that, that last clip where he died and I'm not going to try to downplay the tragedy of his death because it was a tragedy, but they were charged now with murder, but I can see it after watching this video where they don't get charged with murder. And, you know, depending on what happens up to that, that time, I feel like that could be the real big powder keg again. Like it was the last time when he died, like all of a sudden, boom, that was a powder keg. keg in 92. Exactly. Yeah. So to me personally, I, I, if Trump wins, people will be upset. There might be some fists thrown. There might be one or two cases of violence. You know, that's maybe a little more optimistic, but I don't see it being a huge thing of violence. I think the thing that would be the biggest powder keg right now is what happens to those officers in Minnesota that are involved with the, uh, the George Floyd. Um, so 
that's kind of my concerns. That's kind of my thoughts. Um, but like I said, if gut instinct right now for as far as Tuesday night, I don't know why, but I feel like Trump is probably going to win again. So, mm. Yeah, that's honestly my inclination as well. Mm. I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of hesitancy over Biden and there's, I've seen a lot more enthusiasm for Trump than I have seen for Biden. And I know that Trump has lost a lot of his supporters uh, and Coulter famously, but he's also gained some supporters. Um, you mentioned people like Ben Shapiro and Shapiro is a huge platform and he openly advocated for Trump. And I think Trump um, has a lot of, especially a lot of silent supporters, um, people that mm. aren't very, vocal about their vote well people are afraid Um, to admit it yeah yeah exactly people are afraid to admit it and that's i mean that's something that that probably doesn't get talked about enough enough and that you shouldn't shame people into their political opinions like we need to have open and honest discussions about everything that matters to us as a society like i love that we can just hop on a podcast and around the world just talk about things that matter and i know that leaving this podcast like if there's any, right, if there's any hit state or anything that needs to be cleared up, like I get the benefit of the doubt from you guys. Like it's just, I don't feel like, I, you know, I, I don't feel like if I, if maybe I said something that was maybe a little off kilter a little bit, you know, like I'm not going to be accused of being a, a, a white nationalist when I, when I leave this podcast. And I feel like that a lot of people don't get ban- granted that kind of benefit. Like, you know, you, you should be able to advocate or, you know, say, hey, I'm voting for Trump without feeling like you're a racist, without feeling like you're, and the same thing goes for Biden. Like if you're in right-wing circles and you're a, a Democrat, you shouldn't feel like you have to hide your political opinion. Um, and I feel like a lot of people do that, especially for Trump right now. And that's why it wouldn't surprise me that Trump would win. And I feel like, and that's why me and Jameson started that podcast. Our own podcast was because we felt like conversations needed to happen and we wanted to be able to have a place where people could dialogue and talk about things that matter to them. But yeah, I honestly would not be surprised if Trump won. Um, I, I feel like people should be able to talk about things that matter to them and to advocate for the things that matter to them. And we should all be able to give people the benefit of the doubt. You could, you could come to me with any opinion. You could come to me with the most radical opinion, right? If, 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 Jared Taylor or Richard Spencer, right? These, I don't know if people are familiar with them, but they're like these right wing white nationalists. Like if they wanted to come and have a dialogue with me, I could talk to them. And I feel like I, obviously I use them because they're the most inflammatory, mm-hmm. the most kind of uh, insane <laughs> uh, example, but we should be able to have conversations with anybody. And the more you oppress opinions, the more you shun them into a corner like the more that they fester and if opinions and, and thoughts aren't brought out into the limelight where the best and most reasonable and most sustained and evidence-based arguments can win, then we're just going to continue to, to hate each other, right? We should be able to have good reason discussion based on, on scientific evidence and good reason. And we shouldn't shun people just because they think differently than us. Yeah. I, uh... I, I am in full agreement with that. But one thing I've definitely learned from doing this podcast is while I, I am a, a full ingredient with conversation and dialogue and, and all those things, I can also understand and empathize why, why some people, especially when they come from marginalized communities, why they feel that, you know, passion to, to, not, to not necessarily just engage in dialogue and and the example I often phrase is, you know, if someone was openly trying to kill a re- redheads, because I'm a ginger and people hate redheads. Like I still get to be the butt end of the joke. Um, but, you know, His if someone was like, oh, too. <laughs> you know, if they were like, I hate redheads, I want them to all die. I I do definitely understand that it would be very hard to, for me to like sit down with them and be like, okay, like, let's talk this out. Like, why do you, you know what, you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, that, that's the biggest thing I've, I've learned with this podcast is going back to that conversation of complexity and how humans are complex that I think that element always remains. And I, well, I don't necessarily agree. And I definitely 
no 99% of my heart knows that that type of action will never lead to change. It'll just create more division. I also understand why it happens. So anyway, that, that's kind of my thought on that. I just wanted to make sure I, I, I got that out there. Um, thank you, both of you, so much for, for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, if people want to check out your podcast, uh, you guys, social media, website, anything like that? Yeah. Uh, we're on Twitter at owl underscore podcast. Um, our email is the owl podcast at gmail.com. And I think we have a new website now. I think it's just anchor.fm slash owl podcast. Um, and then another thing I was going to throw out to you as well is if mm. you want, you are welcome to be on our podcast at any time as well as a guest. Let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. I would so love to come. That would be great. We can yeah. talk about we, Canada. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. show that's up here. <laughs> the only thing I know about Canada I've gotten from Letterkenny, so I apologize. Um, so that is that. a, it's a very good representation of who we are. Uh, I won't perfect. lie. Like, I think you've got a lot out of it from Letterkenny. Mm. <laughs> it's one of my favorite um, shows, so perfect. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, if shit does go to South, um, stay safe. I hope we, but uh, who knows what will happen. And uh, fuck, Tuesday night, that's going to be wild. So uh, I know. <laughs> yeah. looking forward It'll be to an interesting, interesting night. following the news. Um, yeah. Boys, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. Thanks thank for you. having us on. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole.